This is Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell, all talk and all crime. One of the nation's longest prominent unsolved murders, 50 years and counting, a reinvestigation into the murder of a U.S. senator's daughter does our guest solve the cold case. That's today on Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Glenn Wall started out as an ad copywriter but migrated over time to a passion for investigative journalism, nonfiction, history, and mysteries. Glenn's book on the murder of former Illinois Senator Charles Percy's daughter is Sympathy Vote, a reinvestigation of the Valerie Percy murder. And from the Chicago area right now, hi, Glenn Wall, how are you? Good, thanks, Jim. Uh, now, let me just say, the book is riveting. As we've talked before, it's personal to me. I'm from Illinois. I interned for Senator Percy. I actually had the chance to swim in an indoor pool associated with the house where Valerie Percy was killed. And then in a final kind of weird thing, I happen to have twins, too. Valerie Percy was a twin. Start off, Glenn, what does sympathy vote mean? little background. That just came because everyone I talked to about this case and the crime and about working on Percy's campaigns at that time, whether they were a neighbor or a a volunteer friend working on the campaign, a cop who uh, investigated it, they all said, literally within the first few minutes of talking to them, they would say, well, of course, everyone thought there was a sympathy vote. And it was kind of funny because to most people, I don't think they would know know what that meant, but within the context of this crime. You know, immediately I knew what it meant, but it was just kind of funny, no matter what background they were from, it was one of the things they remembered from this time and this case and this crime. And we should say that she was murdered on uh, September 16th of 1966, right before the election. He was running for the Senate then, is that right? Yeah, it was actually the 18th, and okay. um, it was I think it was about five weeks before Election Day, On his, and that was his second campaign. First campaign was for governor, which, uh, which he lost. Which he lost. Glenn, why hasn't, in a nutshell, why hasn't this high-profile crime been solved? I don't know about the evidence, uh, if, they, if there is the evidence to solve it at this point, but I think that a lot of people just instantly think, well, it's a small, it's a small town, police didn't have the experience to solve crimes like this. But in, in reality, Chicago was involved in this crime probably a half hour after it happened, and they kind of turned it over to Chicago. So that really is kind of a a misconception. But I do think that probably it was about eight days later that the state and the city got more involved in it. And it it was a very strange case with Percy being a high-profile guy and knowing so many people in Illinois. So many leads came in. I think, you know, that certainly didn't make it easier. Everyone was calling. Everybody had something to check out. And I think had Valerie not been the daughter of a famous person or well-known person, there would have been so many fewer leads, and that would have helped, I think. I'll tell you, talking about leads, when I interned, that was 1973, seven years later, and during the lunch hour, I would often sit at the uh, at the desk and take the calls while the other folks were at lunch, and I literally would get, um, on some days, I would get calls about the murder, which we were told to give over to the FBI, but it was pretty amazing. Uh, Kenilworth, which is where this happened, very small community, very upscale, and uh, just to put this in perspective for our show, we've done a lot on the Skakel murder case. I've talked to you about it in Greenwich. A lot of similarities, right? Rich community, maybe an overkill rage kind of thing, mistakes made by the police. Uh, mm-hmm. s- similarities like that? Uh, well, a young, a young woman uh, beaten and stabbed to death uh, at her family's home. Um, neighbors possibly involved. Um, so, yes, lots of similarities. Tell us now why you got involved, what your passion is in relationship to the case. Well, um, actually, investigating this was sort of a, um, a, you know, I hadn't planned to go into the murder. I had planned possibly to do a story about the people who were working on his campaigns in the mid-60s because I knew a few of them and their stories were interesting, and those stories ended up in the book. But what happened was there just weren't enough people left to tell a book-length story and I shelved that idea, and about you know about a year later, just by accident, um, somebody thought that I was investigating the murder and sent me to a new uh, a new source, and it sort of took off in the direction of the crime. All right, um, for folks that obviously this is a long time ago and uh, who aren't from Illinois, tell us basically who uh, Senator Percy was. Very successful as a young guy running a business. Tell us a little bit about Percy and the family briefly. Well, he was, um, you know, supposedly a little entrepreneur as a, you know, second grader. He was from the Chicago area, the north side, 
um, ended up in the north suburbs, I think, during his high school years. And then he had a phenomenal career um, in business at a time, probably the greatest time to be in business in the United States, uh, the 1950s. Um, he, he went to work for Bell & Howell, rose up through the company, uh, was leading the company, and I think they said that they, they I think they, their profits or their business grew 13 times during his time there. So, you know, that was another thing that made, I think, that this time in history is just an interesting time to read about because... And I'll say I'll say that I obviously I worked for him for a while, and he he was the kind of Republican in that era that is now extinct, unfortunately, a fiscal mm-hmm. conservative, a social progressive, um, mm-hmm. and uh, he was going to run for president. Actually, luckily, right when I was there, uh, they I saw the speech draft that was going to announce it, and then Watergate derailed his campaign. All right, now we're going to move into the heart of the thing. Take us, if you can, a step by step through the night of the murder. I believe. Valerie was at home that night with her family, had dinner. Her sister, her twin Sharon, had been out at a rally. I believe it was at Northwestern University and came home around 10 p.m. Valerie had had dinner with a couple of uh, campaign aides who left. I think Chuck Percy got home late around midnight. Of course, he was working, uh, campaigning very heavily at that time. He retired to go to bed. Valerie was last seen, I think, in her room by her sister watching TV. And then her sister uh, went to sleep probably around 11 or so. And that was it until just before 5 a.m. Mrs. Percy was awoken by noise. That's all she said. That, uh, or She heard some noise, and then she heard some footsteps downstairs, and I believe that she thought that those were one of the three children that were home that night. She drifted back to sleep, woke up again, heard what she described as moaning, got up to investigate, walked down the hall. At first, she thought it was Sharon's room that the sound was coming from, but as she got up to Sharon's door, she heard the sound was coming from farther down the hall. That was Valerie's room. Uh, As she approached the door, she saw that it was closed. She saw some light coming out from underneath the uh, door. She was calling out Valerie's name. She pushed the door open, and there she saw the shadow of a man standing, I believe it was a man, standing over the bed, crouching in her description, and Valerie was covered with blood. He was holding a flashlight on her and then turned and uh, shined the flashlight in her eyes. And she said they were frozen there for a moment. Nobody knows how long that went. Then uh, immediately uh, Mrs. Percy pulled the door shut, ran down the hall, and woke up her husband. Boy, that was riveting. All right, tell us how you think they got in the house and, you know, the break-in kind of piece of it. Well, Chuck Percy, I think he'd only been asleep three or four hours at that point. Said he bounded out of his bed and went to check on Valerie, who was obviously fatally wounded. And then his wife stayed there with Valerie. He ran downstairs to investigate, went looking through this rather large house, and didn't see anything out of the ordinary until he got to the uh, one of the rear rooms where uh, they kept the piano. And uh, he saw that there was a door open right next to some heavy drapes. And as he got up closer, he saw the broken glass. You know, this is a, I think there were two panes in this door. The top pane was almost completely broken out. And then he went outside. Then realizing that uh, the killer might still be in the house, he ran back in and went up to uh, help protect Mrs. Percy and the family. Were there signs of sexual assault? um, Or at this stage, they're just trying to survive? I've I've never read anything um, about that. And, of course, Mrs. Percy walked in during the crime and didn't see anything to give that indication. So I, I don't think that was, I don't think that was came to play. Now but Senator Percy did not. They didn't find stuff stolen, looking like a, like a typical burglary, right? And and and, and where, the, where was the evidence of where they went getting out of the house? Because the house was on the lake, we should say. Right. Um, they didn't find any other doors open or windows open. So it's believed that the perpetrator ran back out of the house through the back door, through this back door, which was not used by the family. Often it was uh, opened up to a patio uh, in the northeast side of the house. But the first cop that morning to examine the evidence outside the house walked around the back of the house and saw footprints in the dew going down the, uh, the bluff there at the beach in a southerly southeast direction. Um, and he followed the footprints down on the grass to the beach where they turned into the sand and then they, uh, he saw them go to the, you know, disappear into the uh, water. 
and the uh, some of the evidence, you know, was found in that direction down the beach. All right, now, now let's just interject here. We're five weeks before the campaign. Um, what happened campaign-wise? Um, they suspended the campaign. Um, the uh, Percy's, um, Percy's, uh, the, the uh, current governor, the current um, senator, Percy was running against, um, he suspended his campaign as well um, for, I believe, it was two weeks. And they never really got back to hitting the campaign trail, making the appearances um, that you would you would normally have. They just, uh, I think, did interviews on in the media from that point on. And um, obviously a very uh, gracious move by the opponent. And uh, Percy ended up winning. Uh, Percy then decided he would not uh, give up the campaign and won by a significant, significant amount, right, your sympathy vote. Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, to this day they wonder, how much of a sympathy vote he got. He was very well liked um, at that time. He was, you know, he, he'd had a very good run as uh, in his losing uh, bid for uh, governor. When you consider he was a complete unknown, yeah. um, that was a very strange campaign, but uh, you know, he, he did really well considering that was his first, first run and he didn't have the backing of the party or anything like that. We're talking with Glenn Wall. He's investigated reinvestigated uh, the murder of Senator Percy's daughter, Valerie Percy, in 1966. It remains unsolved. And um, he has some explosive findings himself of the unsolved murder. We're going to talk about the conventional suspects, etc. But first, we're going to start with who he's uncovered and, and his theory of the case. Uh, tell us about William Thorson III and, you know, start off talking about him. Well, he was... Um he had been a former neighbor of the Percy's. His parents, at the time of the murder, were still uh, Kenilworth residents, living about a block and a half from Percy's home. Um, he had had a, I think he was 28 at the time of the uh, Percy murder in 66. He had had a long history of violence and criminal activity. He'd been in, uh, he'd actually escaped one way or another from numerous mental institutions since he was a teenager. He'd been a suspect in a brutal murder in Chicago in the late 1950s, which also was never solved. Um, that, you know, he, he was just well-known to the police. Uh, in 1965, even though he no longer lived in Kenilworth, he, kept, he was there uh, many times with his brother uh, during that summer and kept the police department quite busy. Um, tell us a little bit of background about his parents. I mean, this was a, a wealthy family, a block and a half from the Percy's. Mm-hmm. His father... Um, his father ran a steel distribution business in Chicago, and uh, they played a significant role in World War II, and he was a multimillionaire uh, at, at the time when a million dollars was considerably a lot, considerably more money than it is today. Obviously, he's therefore under the nose of the Kenilworth police, but he was never, uh, and even to this day, he's not been a conventional suspect. Is that right? The police have not commented on him. On him. Um, he was actually a suspect in the case. The uh, Illinois State Police that were running the case from the eighth day uh, did receive a um, inquiry from a parole officer in Los Angeles who was actually Thorson's parole officer out there. He had a you know multi-state uh, career, criminal career, and he had contacted this parole officer had contacted. Uh, the Illinois State Police and said that they that he thought that Thorson should be considered a suspect in this case. So he was a suspect in this case, and of course we found out later that the FBI believed that he was a great suspect in this case. He had huge caches of weapons, right? Um, talk a little bit about that, and, and was can we assume he was mentally ill? Um, I would say that for sure. With his history in mental institutions from local to state in Illinois, um, but uh, his his history of his thing was guns and, and cannons, and but also not limited to there were bayonets in his stash of uh, belief. They weighed it by the ton. Um, in the spring after the Percy murder, he was um, arrested, and he had these gigantic storage lockers in, San Francisco, in the San Francisco area, full of all of his weaponry. A lot of it was old, um, and. Uh, 
if you remember, one thing that I thought was interesting about the Percy murders, it was really four crimes. It was the fourth in a string of crimes the police all knew were one were the same person. Mm-hmm. And that first crime was a thwarted burglary about a mile from Percy's house in Winnetka, and the suspect was in the uh, process of stealing guns. And guns, of course, were Thorson's favorite thing. Um, just before we, uh, I want to interject this. You mentioned bayonet. What's the significance of bayonet? Um, three days after the Percy murder, the police found a bayonet in Lake Michigan about 40 feet uh, from shore in about four feet of water just down the beach in the direction of the footprints that the uh, officer saw the morning of the murder. Um, and this is about a 16-inch World War II bayonet, um, which very much fits in the um, age of the weaponry that Thorison was uh, often seen um, with or was arrested with. And um, his wife was arrested about not quite three months after the murder, shipping numerous weaponry on his behalf to him. And in that cache of weapons were three identical bayonets as the ones found. All right, tell us now that um, he had his own brother killed, I believe, and the body was found, I think, in Lake Forest, where I happened to grow up, and where there was a burglary that looked like the Percy's of people that we know. Talk about that. Well, the... the, um, I'm trying to to remember if it was the second. The second crime in this spree was a a home invasion like the Percy's house. Um, It was a robbery uh, of a very wealthy uh, Lake Forest resident. And then um, I believe it was September 21st, 1965, almost a year uh, from the date of the Percy murder, Thorison's brother was found shot in a car. He had a gunshot wound to the head. It was suspicious because the wound was on the opposite side of his head from, I believe he was left-handed, and, it, and the wound was on the right hand, uh, side of his head, or vice versa. I can't remember exactly. But um, years later, Thorison's wife said that he admitted to having been behind having his brother killed. Um, she wrote a book which goes through some of his stuff. Uh, talk about what she identified, um, other big ones, but also um, he also tried to stage what would look like a murder-suicide of his own parents, right? Mm-hmm. Right. And that that was about, I believe that was in April of 66, so that would have been about six months from the Percy murder, a block and a half away. Um, he, he had the motive, she had said the motive for having his brother killed was they were the only two siblings in the family of this multimillionaire, and so he was going to have the entire uh, fortune to himself if he killed his brother, and then he was going to kill his parents after that, about six months after that, and obviously if he killed his parents, he would have inherited the money, unless otherwise something happened. And we're having a riveting conversation with Glenn Wall of Chicago. He's done a reinvestigation of the unsolved 50 years and counting murder of Valerie Percy. She was the daughter of the senator, and he was senator-elect at the time. Charles H. Percy became a presidential pros- uh, prospect as well. We'll be right back to look at more of his findings and talk about the case. This is Jim Campbell, host of Forensic Talk. Tune into this station on Monday evenings at 6 p.m. for deep dives into the biggest crime stories today. Unsolved murders, financial crimes, penetrating questions. I'm John I. Newsy, producer of Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. Each week, you'll hear in-depth interviews. Whether it's Bobby Kennedy Jr. on his claims his cousin Michael Skakel is innocent of the Moxley murder, or a brutally honest conversation with Kathleen Willey, one of the women alleging sexual assault in the Clinton Oval Office. Or the first interview after prison with an insider trader from the Raj Rajaratnam biggest insider trading scandal in Wall Street history. That's Monday night at 6 p.m. We'll bring you the facts, the forensic, both sides of the story, from insider trading to crimes of passion. Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell is brought to you by Park City Productions. Like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and follow us on Instagram. That's Park City Productions 06604.
And we're back with Glenn Wall, findings of his reinvestigation of the Percy murder. That's Valerie Percy, the twin daughter of former Illinois Senator Charles Percy, the murder in 1966, unsolved here in 2017. Uh, I want to finish up on Louise Thorson, the wife who wrote this book. Does she, in this book, uh, implicate um, William in the murder or anything to do with the Percy murder? No, and that's the fascinating thing, because she implicates him in, in things that were equally or even perhaps you know, mul- you know, multiple murders or attempted multiple murders. And um, so that's sort of the fascinating thing is what did Louise know or later say to anyone or anybody else in the family uh, as the years went by after the Percy murder. And just to add to this bizarre Thorson family, tell us what happened to William. I believe it was June 1970. Um, William had numerous lawsuits against him, criminal and I believe otherwise, um, regarding his violence and collection, illegal collection of weapons, because after after he was arrested with a large cache of them, he was prevented from, uh, it was illegal for him to, to get any more, but of course he went back to that. Um, and in the, uh, I believe it was June of, of uh, 70, 1970, uh, he confessed to his wife. Now, he had abused her for many, many years, and um, after several days of extreme abuse again, he had confessed to her um, his uh, role in several murders, including that of his brother. And uh, it was a bad time for him to do that because she was holding a gun at the time, and, and uh, at one point he lunged at her, and according to her, and she killed him. So um, now we're going to swing over a little bit to the conventional suspects, uh, put that in perspective, and we'll come back to Thorson. Um, tell us, first of all, did you uncover any fundamentally new facts? Obviously, this suspect um, is essentially new in that sense. Uh, d- new facts, and were there fundamental mistakes, as there were in Greenwich by the police um, in the Skagel investigation? Was the same thing true there? I think if you looked at the crime scene and compared it to the way they do things today, probably, as far as the securing of the crime scene, I believe at that time, in those days, they basically secured the house and mostly Valerie's room today. Probably the entire block would have been uh, blocked off. I think they probably blocked off the beach, but how successful they were in doing that, I'm not sure. There were some things that were said by Chicago authorities that make me question how accurate, you know, or if deliberately inaccurate things were said so as not to reveal too much to the press and too much to the public at a time right after the murder had happened. I don't think it was quite like the case in Greenwich where people were walking right through the immediate crime scene. All right, let's get to the conventional uh, suspects. Obviously, the thing looks like, on the surface, a break-in to burglarize the house that maybe got botched somehow. I know there are a bunch of people that fit into that sort of burglar, uh, you know, professional burglars, if you will, there's the this gang that was called Jackson Wilson and Fred Malchow, who some people said did it. Talk about the uh, the burglar theory and some of the folks there. Well, the interesting thing about that is 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 like you said when you were working for Mr. Percy uh, in 1973, a lot of that stuff hit the newspapers, and I can understand why you were getting calls because that was big time for the case. A lot of that information hit the, hit the airwaves and, and the newspapers. The Jackson Wilson Malchow gang. Uh, and, and one of their colleagues, at least, had a history of burglarizing uh, homes in uh, on Chicago's North Shore for quite a while. They were connected uh, to, some of them were connected to the Chicago outfit. So that presented a lot of interesting theories. Um, there were just some problems with what happened at Percy's house and their MOs. Uh, in some ways, they match up being in the house, going into the house to do things like that. But then, of course... <laughs> Assault, uh, or certainly murder, was now part of their M.O. Also, there were some problems fitting Mrs. Percy's eyewitness description of the uh, offender. Uh, While we're on Mrs. Percy, Lorraine Percy, I hadn't realized this, by the way, um, that she was the stepmother of, um, Mm -hmm. I didn't know she'd been married before, of Valerie. So there's some folks that thought that maybe she'd done it. Well, certainly somebody in the house, uh, might have done it, and because she was a stepmother rather than a mother, uh, for what that's worth, uh, 
Um, I think the thing is, is this was a very violent crime. Valerie had uh, extensive defensive wounds, and so who, I think there was a very good chance that whoever perpetrated this probably had a you know a bloody nose or a split lip. There were things said about teeth marks on her knuckles. Um, so I think uh, you know they showed up to the house, and no one in the house had any physical injuries. They arrested a motorcyclist uh, outside of the house not long after the murder. Uh, he didn't show any signs of him being in a struggle, and it, and it would really look like, given the evidence, that whoever did this would have shown signs of having been in a, in a fight. Um, let me ask that question, too. That um, Mrs. Percy uh, described the uh, person as about five foot seven. Thorson, your guy, is about 6'2". Does that discrepancy bother you? No, in fact, um, because she described the person as leaning over the bed, um, and she saw him from about 9 to 12 feet away. If you saw somebody who was 6'1 or 6'2 leaning over a bed, you know, who had been assaulting somebody, uh, and if they were that tall, they would have to lean over the bed. From that distance, I would think probably 5 inches. You would take 5 inches or so off of that um, description. All right, now there were um, a lot of false confessions um, as well. Um, there's a guy, Frank Hoemer, you said, who was implicated by his brother and a mobster. Is that a, mm-hmm. any validity to that, you think? Right. He was, uh, he was, a uh, Hoheimer was a, uh, college, you know, he had been brought in, he was a very successful burglar in Chicago and was recruited by the mafia, um, and was an associate of, of the Jackson Wilson, Wilson Alchow gang, um, though he did not work for them. Um, but he wrote a book himself, and actually the book was turned into a movie. I believe it was Jim Belushi's first movie um, in the early 1980s. Uh, and he um, very painstakingly puts out his M.O. And one of the things he did is, is he said he never, ever went into any house to commit any crime without uh, having a mask over his face. Mrs. Percy didn't see a mask on this person, um, and there was none found at the scene or anywhere on Percy's property. So that doesn't really fit in with Hoheimer's M.O. M.O. Okay, um, uh, there was a person that was in prison in Canada who apparently on his deathbed uh, confessed to his cellmate that it was a botched robbery that ended up in Val's death. Um, I'm told that the Percy family has put some credibility on that because he knew a lot of unpublicized details. Do you know who this person is and any thoughts? Um, doesn't strike a bell. Um, I would have to know what that person's criminal history was and if they had any, any uh, history of violence in any of these uh, crimes that he committed before. Um, you know, one thing, having the three other crimes leading up to the Percy murder, you can kind of see what fits you know, what's, uh, what happens over and over again in these crimes and what doesn't. And that's the strange thing about it is these three crimes, one was, the, one was a thwarted burglary, one was a home invasion, uh, uh, bur- home invasion robbery, another one was a thwarted home invasion. There are things that don't fit. This person didn't seem to have the same M.O. all the time, which you have, I think, with the Jackson Wilson uh, guys. Um, and that sort of fits Thorson. Thorson was the son of a millionaire. He had all his money. Why was he going out? He could have done anything he wanted in life, and he was, he was going out, and he was sort of this petty thief who at times was caught. Why was he doing this? It didn't make any sense. Of course, he'd been in mental institutions. There's a pattern. You know, he had a history of being in area homes without permission, sometimes just breaking in just for the sake of breaking in, just to do it. So that, that kind of makes me look at him as a very good suspect in this case. And in fact, uh, I think in breaking into the uh, Freddie Wacker's house in Lake Forest, who we know, that he also used that flashlight in the face thing when he was caught. Yes, and there was a, there was a, a, a glass cutter used to cut a round circle in the glass. I believe that was also, I believe I read an account of that in the first uh, thwarted burglary in Winnetka. There was this round uh, circular cut in the glass in an attempt to knock that round piece of glass out, and many, you know, numerous times that apparently failed, and he ended up just cutting an X over the spot and bashing it in, which is what happened in Percy's house. So that is a very strange, and actually, I think some people would tell you that was a very amateurish way to break in. 
people using glass cutters to break into a house, you know, do that because they're amateurs and they see things in movies where people are shown doing that. But in reality, people like the Jackson Wilson Malchow gang know how to jimmy a window or, or pick a lock or do something to get in quietly and without leaving a lot of evidence. Okay, let's pursue this angle now. Um, Valerie Percy, why her or why would, would somebody want her killed? Um, or you think that that's completely random that of all the folks in the house, uh, and there were, I think, Gail, Mark, uh, both the Mr. and Mrs. Percy, mm-hmm. uh, right. Sharon, and Valerie. That's a lot of folks. Right. To this day, we don't know. Uh, Mark was not home. It was, there were Mr. and Mrs. Percy, Gail, uh, the, the younger daughter, and uh, so there were five people, Valerie and her twin sister. Uh, no one knows if this person entered other rooms first. Um, of course, the police have kept things, certain things quiet about the evidence, um, so you can't take it for granted that there, were, there was no other evidence um, because they, they have to keep things uh, in an effort to be able to have a credible confession. Um, keep certain things quiet, but um, that's the million-dollar question. You had uh, thousands of leads, um, probably hundreds of suspects, uh, a long investigation which goes on to this day, and just as far as I know, there just isn't anyone else who's been shown to have had a conventional reason. Valerie wasn't involved in, in crime herself. Um, there doesn't seem there don't seem to be any spurned boyfriends, any kind of romantic. Uh, reason, uh, motive, and she was just so well liked by so many people. Yes. Um, let me ask you this: What do you have knowledge of the logistical layout of the upstairs and the bedrooms? Mm-hmm. Sure, you do. Okay, because um, from what I've heard, um, it would it would seem that it would be very low odds that Valerie's room would have been the one they went into on a random basis. Um, if there's no motive here or no focus, um, and you're doing a burglary downstairs, to go upstairs itself made no, no sense. It was very risky. But one would right. have thought, I would have thought, well, I'm gonna, the first room, oh, there's somebody in there. That's where it's going to happen. Or something that there was a reason. But her, the location of her bedroom would not have put her anywhere near a logical random attack. Right. Well, one thing that Soros's, uh wife makes clear in her book was that Thorison, who never had a stable mental condition, after the death of his brother, deteriorated further and became you know, more unpredictable, more unstable, more violent. And you're looking at a person who, like I said, he would steal things just to steal them, just to do it. He, he stole, I believe there was a case where he stole some, uh, I think it was somewhere in the Northeast, he was on vacation, and he stole some canoes from a sporting goods shop. He went in at night several times, stole these canoes, took them back to his uncle's house and put them in his uncle's shed. Didn't even use them, just stole them to do it. I mean, he was a very strange person. So if you imagine him becoming even more unstable and then having it, you know, in recent months, being in, in Kenilworth, you know, with homicidal in, intent, that you would expect nothing to make sense. Yeah, from what I understand, the, the 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 logistics are such that it would be very uh, unusual and bad luck that he would have ended up in Valerie's room amongst the five or six bedrooms there. And, of course, there's a third floor as well where Roger's room was. He was out west. Um, it, it, it raises real questions uh, in, in my mind. Now, some of the evidence that you say was uncovered, um, take us through that. There were fibers, the bayonet. Go through that, and, and has there, is there, could you do retrospective DNA now that exists, or is there something there that would help us at this stage? Um, I don't know if they, what kind of DNA samples they could obtain of the suspects from the suspects. Um, of course, Malchow died in 67 in a prison break. Um, Thor, the Thorsons, I, I know where his wife ended up. I believe he had a son. Possibly you could do some, uh, get some DNA samples from the son. I don't know if, if the brothers' bodies were cremated um, or where they ended up, but these would be natural avenues, I think, for law enforcement to, to go down and try, and try and get a DNA sample. But I don't know from the, the evidence that was left at the scene um, if, if there's any DNA that's usable at this point. Were there um, finger, finger, fingerprints? 
there were there were blood stains left on a ballot a banister. Um, quite possibly, if this person had to to open the door that Mrs. Percy slammed to get out again, uh, there could have been uh, evidence there. Um, with this big fight and this big knife, um, I would say there's probably a fairly good chance that this person may have been injured um, in, in the in the uh, mayhem that went on there. Whether they've been able to find this yet, I don't know. I, they, they're, there's a new task force that's been rededicated to solving this, but the evidence has been sent back to the crime lab in Illinois several times uh, since the early 90s, I believe, early 2000s. And, uh, so far, we haven't heard anything. Uh, we should say that there was a glove found, like the, like the uh, bloody glove in the Simpson case. Right. Um, also, there, there were footprints. Be, be, many, many gloves are found at crime scenes. The um, the footprints. There were footprints outside on the way to the beach and everything. What's the significance of the moccasin? The police have downplayed that. I didn't get into this too much in the book, but I think if you had footprints that went out to the beach, um, this person would have walked into the water. So if they were wearing something like a moccasin and they were running from a from a murder or an attempted murder, um, that that those shoes would have become heavy from having been in the water and might have come off. Um, the significance to Thorison was that, you know, moccasins, I think, became in style in, in six, not too long after this crime, 1967, 1968, the sort of hippie fashions that came in. But this was, this was in the fall of 66 before that. But Thorison had, had a residence at that time in San Francisco, and that, of course, was all going on in the hate. All right, as we, as we finish and, up, have you had have you had folks have the police and folks have have they been amenable to your theory do they are they giving it serious consideration um the police uh i think i have a good i've had a good relationship with the police uh i know that bob lamb still believes that uh mal chow or someone from that group was responsible um they've been amenable to me and they've helped me but they keep you know when it comes to things like evidence they don't discuss that. And of course, like the Skakel case, we're now going to stay on this case until hopefully there's a resolution. Greenwich lawyer John Kelly, who was involved in the O.J. Simpson civil case and won it, um, is uh, for the Goldmans, I believe. He is interested in this case. He grew up in the Evanston area, I think. So we're going to stay on this case. We're going to keep close to Glenn Wall. Book, Sympathy Voter, Reinvestigation of the Valerie Percy Murder. Glenn, thanks for your time. Thank you, Jim. Great to be on the show. You're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. And you're listening to Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. This is our final national segment, and we're going to continue to look into what's going next in the unsolved Percy murder case. We're joined by a leading national attorney who's taken an interest in the case, actively working to shed some sunlight into the investigation. That's John Q. Kelly, attorney with Ivy Barnum and O'Meara. That's here in Greenwich down the road from the studio, in fact, but he's got landmark big-time victories under his belt, including lead attorney for the estate of Nicole Brown Simpson and its wrongful death civil action against O.J. Simpson, winning that case after O.J. Simpson had been found not guilty of murder in the criminal trial, and is attorney for Beth Holloway relating to the international story of the disappearance, presumed murder, of her daughter Natalie Holloway, uh, um, Holloway on a spring break at the, on the island of Aruba. And it was apparently John's personal interactions with the suspect, Joran Vandersloot, that directly led to Vandersloot being indicted in the U.S. on federal uh, extortion and uh, fraud counts. Uh, welcome, John. That's a pretty impressive resume. Thanks, Jim. And thanks Good for to be coming. here. Sure. Thanks for coming in the studio. We're both uh, from Chicago, so we both have longtime interest in the Percy murder case. Tell us what drives you at this point to get into it. Well, it was uh, Kenilworth, as you know, is a very small village on the shore of Lake Michigan, north of Chicago. Uh, I grew up about two miles north of there in Glencoe, right on the shore of Lake Michigan also. Uh, one of those big old houses. I was a family of nine. I had six sisters. I had a sister who was 21 at the time of the, the Percy murder, and it was just such a unheard of thing, a, a murder at all along the North Shore, especially of a uh, 21-year-old girl in her own home of a prominent family, and it just uh, it just had an impact to me. I was 13 years old, lived in 
sort of the same environment with the same concerns. And I just remember it vividly from that time. And the, the Valerie Percy murder has always been a part of North Shore lore since the time it happened. Why do you think in over 50 years it remains unsolved? Uh, not sure about that. Uh, that's actually why I sort of started looking into it again. It doesn't seem like it should be a, a murder that is unsolved. And I think a lot of people thought right from the start it should have been something that was solved very quickly. And, uh, you know, it's been 50 years. I didn't follow it at all in between the 50 years. It's not something I've been obsessed with since I was 13. I was actually on the Internet looking up some stuff. I was doing a 10th anniversary thing on Holloway and a 20th anniversary on Simpson. And I saw a banner about the, the Percy murder, and I pulled it up to see what had happened with it, and I saw it had never been solved. Um, I actually put in a, a very simple request to the Kenilworth police, just basically saying, could I see a, a, the file on it, not knowing it was this yeah. voluminous thing of, you know, 10,000 interviews and blah, blah, blah. And uh, they immediately denied that, and I just called the chief of police at Kenilworth just said, I, you know, could I just stop by? I'm kind of curious. I grew up there, and uh, I'd like to see, you know, like the crime scene photos. And he was like, no, you can't see anything that's, you know, we're still actively investigating this. And, uh, you know, no chance of you getting any information. And uh, so that just sort of pushed me a little, my curiosity. Why can, they they, were, can they refuse to do a Freedom of Information? Well, I, sub, I submitted that, and they claimed that it was an active, ongoing investigation 50 years later, and that any information they would release would impede that investigation, which I thought I still think is borderline absurd. That do, you, claim, do you think that it might be because they uh, worried, like in the Greenwich here, when we have the uh, Moxie murder, that the police initially didn't know what the heck they were doing because they don't handle murders, and maybe... Um, more no. embarrassed by covering mistakes up? No, I don't think it was to cover up mistakes. I I think there's a lot that was known about what happened in that house and probably who or how this murder was committed that's that's in that file somewhere. You really believe that? I really do believe that. And why wouldn't they have tried to solve it then and take it right through? That That's the big question. I mean, you, you know, you had uh, the presidential politics. You had a lot of big hitters around there at that time. You know, uh, In Cold Blood was the number one bestseller. The Same Manson as, murders apparently were right around then? In, no, the, uh, what was it, the, the, murse, the nurse murders. Sorry, Richard Speck. Richard Speck, Which the nurse Chicago. murder. Yes. Sam Shepard was getting ready to go yep. to trial again, yep. you know, over in Ohio. Psycho was coming on, in the, the, on TV and things like that. It was just, you know, sort of murder was front and center, and it was all being sensationalized and things. And this thing just uh, it, it happened out of the blue, and it, as I was telling you before when we were talking, it just sort of arced and disappeared. Valerie was the autopsy. She was removed from the house. The autopsy was conducted the same day. She was cremated the following day. There was a ceremony okay. for the day after that. And the day after that, the entire Percy family got on a private plane, flew to California for two weeks, and wouldn't talk to anybody or answer any questions about it. And that was the end of it. It just sort of... You think they didn't even want to know what happened, or I don't, either that, or they knew exactly what happened and didn't want to talk about it, and never have talked about it then, right? Um, and I don't know that that's just one that of the to speculate. What's yeah. what's the next step for your? I mean, the Kenilworth police stonewalled you. What do you do now? Well, well, it's under appeal. I've got a you know a top firm in Chicago pressing the appeal. They were, I think, everybody is quite surprised that a judge bought into the argument that there was an active ongoing investigation at this time. They did and, buy into that. Yeah, well, that sounds like Chicago, doesn't it? Oh my God, I, I was stunned. I couldn't believe, based on what I was seeing, that that was a decision. But do you have a theory you know, of the case? No, I don't. You don't have. A theory I really of the don't. Case. I I I will say this, Jim, that you know, from what I've gleaned just from the the public records, that the the public accounting of the the crime and the evidence just is does not make sense. You know, this thing about the 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 glass cutter to get in the house. Yeah. You know, you don't hear breaking glass when you use a glass cutter. You know, you don't make circles. You do squares. That's the only way you can right. cut with the glass cutter. You can't make Interesting. circles. Interesting. You use a, a, a rubber suction cup or a piece of putty to hold on to it. There's no shattered glass, which apparently there was from this thing. The dog didn't bark, apparently. The dog didn't bark. The alarm didn't go off. Uh, the intruder didn't take anything. No physical evidence is left when... Um, the first police officer on the scene said there was blood from Valerie's bed all the way up to the ceiling. Really? That she had been bludgeoned in the head and blood was everywhere. So, and that was with the blunt instrument. So you have a, a 
from, from an intruder. Let me just one other okay. thing that what that I thought compelling that an intruder that didn't take anything, didn't cause a dog to bark, uh, didn't set off the alarm, didn't leave any physical evidence, and would have had to be carried a blunt instrument like a, a fireplace poker. The medical examiner said, a large knife, a flashlight, and a glass cutter. You just you know, you'd be juggling more stuff than you could. And with the amount of blood that would have been, you know, from that scene, you, there'd be footprints, there'd be fingerprints, there'd be imprints from weapons, there'd be, you know, trace DNA now from whoever touched her bed clothing and things. It'd just be... Let me ask you about that. Um, obviously, yeah. you know the O.J. Simpson case very well. That was obviously a rage killing, right? Now, yeah. this has always been postulated as a botched um, burglary kind of thing, but it looks like a rage killing, doesn't it? It's, it is... A rage killing. I, I don't see how anybody could claim it was a botched burglary. There was no indication that one thing in the house was disturbed other than Valerie's body. Do we jump to the conclusion that somebody must have known each other in that house, that he must have known her, that he must have had a purpose? Oh, there, there, there are two sort of commonly accepted things that uh, bear on this. One is that homicides in private residence are the most likely to be solved. The percentages of them are much higher than any other sort of homicide. Because somebody's like a fa- like a one of the spouses involved. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's isolated. The evidence is going to be there, and the the suspects are very limited. And secondly, when you have a killing like this, it's up close, close and personal, done with your hands. That the suspects again greatly narrow. You know, it's almost always someone known to the individual, and you know, an emotional attachment there too. So, you know, this had those two earmarks didn't fit any other profile, and yet the police say there's no evidence, no suspects, and everybody's cleared. So it just doesn't make sense. It's very interesting. And basically what you said, the profile of who it should be is the one area that the police has ruled out. They, 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 you know, they've, they've always said that it, it's more of a burglary or it's someone we don't know, as opposed to what we just said, that a rage killing knew where to go in the house, you know, et cetera. Uh, Etc. The bayonet um, weapon that was found in the in the lake, and that Glenn Wall thinks, does that it, fit with the kind of blunt instrument that you were talking about? No, the the, yeah. the coroner said, I think right after the the autopsy, they were looking for a, a blunt instrument like a fireplace poker, and they actually had diagrams in the newspaper showing a, a pointed three quarter inch by inch and three quarter tip that would have been used to strike her head. Really, could that have been at the end of a bayonet? It could have, but the bayonet they had didn't fit the imprints they were talking about or, or crushes. And, Why the, is and the knife wounds were three to four inches deep, and I think that bayonet had an 11-inch you know, blade on it or something like that. So Why um, is, in, in this era, haven't they been able to take any of the evidence for trace DNA? I mean, he, they had footprints going out to the um, lake, right? They discounted those. The they discounted a lot of that stuff. They said they later, you know, first they thought someone would come up from the globe, by the way, like O.J.? Yeah, there'd be definitely trace evidence on that. But, you know, what size was it, man's or woman's? The moccasin, was it a size 2 or a size 14 yeah. that would fit the And the police say the moccasin is irrelevant. They right. say that. Well, they've said everything's irrelevant now. The glove is, the you know, the bayonet was, didn't fit the, the, the Explain murder. Explain to me, why would, why would a police department appear to be indifferent to wanting to solve it? Or blocking any, you know? Just maybe yeah, people that. Do what happened and don't want to. Let's move on. Don't want to. Yeah. Blow up the. All right. Tell us uh, as we finish off. Um, what's next for you? How are you going to keep this alive? How active do you see yourself getting in this? And how uh, how how are you staying with it till the end? Kind of thing. Is it? Well, yeah. We're, we're going to appeal the decision of the, the the judge in Cook County. You know, take it up to the the appellate level. That we are very confident that. A review will show that it's not an active ongoing investigation that would be harmed by disclosing, you know, stuff from 50 years ago. I mean, Do you believe it is ongoing, by the way? I'm sorry? Do you believe the investigation is ongoing? I think they they keep the appearance of something ongoing as a, as a way to probably keep the file closed. I mean, if it was ongoing, you have all these suspects that are talking about, Mal Chow, uh, Hoheimer, right. Thornson, all these guys had right. criminal records, had fingerprints on record. It'd be very easy to discount these guys in a heartbeat but they Kenilworth police doesn't want to they can't come up with any people of interest but they won't discount anybody either and quite frankly that's not fair to these other families too if they have no evidence you know to, to let their names be hung out there yeah. the, the, this, this, i've been contacted by family members of, of two really? of those people yeah 
just said it's a shame, you know, we want to get rid of this thing. You know, my dad didn't do it. He was a bad here. guy. But, you know, they have evidence for that we're sure. With, with, with the sheets with blood and the, the moccasin and whatever else uh, the, with, that would have ev- uh, DNA evidence, is all that stuff saved? Or is that all? Supposedly. Just, so it is. So it's supposedly saved. 21 cartons of evidence really? and documents in the Kenilworth Police. Would you be able to get DNA off of them today or is it too dangerous? Th- no, I think you could. You, you get could get trace evidence off them. Probably, well, I don't. Know, it does, it sort of doesn't make sense. They don't look like they're doing. There'd have to be fingerprints everywhere. I mean, if you're if you have someone handling, you know, a blunt instrument, a knife, a flashlight, and you know, supposedly holding someone down, or you know, just even striking them, and you know, opening the door that's been closed, putting your door on balustrade, going down the stores, trying to get through a little opening of a French door, there would be right. there'd be evidence everywhere. And as you say. Yeah. Um, they w- she went to one person in the house when the house was full of people, which is highly risky and looks targeted and then yeah. looks like a rage killing. Yeah. Now, I'm not a detective, but that seems all that stuff seems pretty obvious. Well, the other thing is there was a doctor from next door that was yes. called over shortly after. Yeah. And his account is very divergent from the, the, the other public accounts. So and by the way, in Glenn's book, at least, the Kenilworth police did not even ask for He wrote like five page. Yeah. Didn't even ask for it. No, and they'd never interviewed him. Yeah. Or his wife. Yeah. And he, and was the first, he was the first person to look at the He was body. there minutes afterwards, and he just said a lot had gone on before he got there, that she was clearly dead when he arrived there, whereas, you know, other people talked about Let me ask you this, because I'm, sure, I'm, yep. not, I'm not sure what I've heard on this one. Did she have defensive wounds that would imply she knew who he was? That pops up in, like, some public accounting, and I know Glenn mentioned it, but the, the coroner's report in the cause of death was the first blow to the head. Really? Yes. So, uh, you know, the rest is overkill. The rest is overkill. So, there's, you know, then you start thinking about hearing, you know, these moanings for a period of time. Nobody would have been moaning with the crushed skull. They were dead on impact, you know, and uh, Which leads, nobody's, leads no to defensive you. wounds. Nobody's going to be right. She was flat on her back, prone in a sleeping position with her head on one side. Killed almost instantly. What, um, what, what do you have any thoughts on Mrs. Percy came in and saw the guy? Right, and put the flashlight in her face and everything? Well, the, 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 the initial account said she couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, black or white. Really? No description whatsoever. You know, I, I have transcripts from it. Really? Did that change, though? Because I, Glenn claims she said he looked 5'7". Yeah, that changed. All of a sudden, you know, the, down the road he had bushy hair. He oh, okay. you know, was 5'8". His weight, all of a sudden she knew what he was wearing that night. Could see his forearms and, you know. Knowing as you, what you do about... Uh, uh, crimes like this, if someone had come in like that, a mother, um, would they uh, would they be able to have seen much with a flashlight? I mean, and, and also they're obviously panicked. I mean, would she have gotten a good look, you would assume, or not? I don't know. There's no way it really. Occurs. Yeah, and you don't know how someone's going to react. You know, do you do you run from the room when someone's in there you think is harming your daughter? Or do you, you know, go right after them, you know? I didn't realize, or, by the way, that she was a stepmother until just recently, that there was a divorce there. Well, no, there wasn't a divorce. Mr. Percy's first wife had died at, oh. suddenly at 26 years old. Her, her marriage was ended in divorce. I yes. Because she had two kids of her own. Well, no, she had uh, no she had No, no they had two, own. two kids of, of, with Percy, I got it, yeah. Yeah, she was 21 when they married. So, so are you confident that this thing can be solved at this stage? I don't know. I just think if it can't be, let people know why it can't be and what was done. You have... Will you go public at some point if you feel you're stonewalled completely by the Kenilworth folks? In what sense? I mean, it's been no secret of but me I mean, trying to get the file open and see it, what's... Is yeah. it a big issue in Chicago, even? Or it, You know, it was covered by the press every time we went to court. They had court cameras in the courtroom. It was, yeah. you know, but people... But there's not an outcry. No outcry. You yeah. know, it's it's 50 years ago, and it's... Just, people don't you know, know who Percy is anymore. There's no file, so there's nothing... You know, it's not like the... John Bonnet Ramsey or Simpson, where they have a bunch of this stuff and, you know, trying to figure out if it's sufficient to convict someone. There's just no file there at all. So, Are you doing this pro bono? Myself? Yeah. Yeah, just out of curiosity. Really? I, yeah. So, it wasn't going to turn into much of anything. I was just kind of curious. But, you know, then all of a sudden I started seeing what had gone on over the years with this thing. But the thought I was going to finish with, Jimmy, of 100,000 people supposedly interviewed more than 100. Is that right? More than 100 law enforcement people working on it at some point. Probably millions of dollars spent. You know, the people have a right to know right. what was done on and the case. And there's never even been a, like a consensus suspect, right? There's not even a person of interest. 
and right away they cleared the family and all uh, friends of any you know suspicion, just based on what nobody knows. Fascinating. So, but well, we're going to be staying with this case just like we are with the uh, the Moxley uh, murder case, and they share the same characteristics: high profile murders unsolved for long uh, periods of time. But I want to thank Glenn Wall and John Q. Kelly. Um, Glenn's book again is "Sympathy Vote: A Reinvestigation of the Valerie and Percy." Murder, and as we just learned, John Q. Kelly is helping move the case forward on a pro bono basis. It's been Forensic Talk with Jim Campbell. We'll stay with this case until we get it solved.